And the first thing I'd say is that I'm apl apologizing on behalf of all the respiratory physicians here that we come up with all these names for respiratory diseases that are just have letters. And, um, you know, for the general physician, lip and lamb and boop and cop and uh, so on and so forth is, is quite challenging. So I'm not sure you'll be glad to hear we're going to go through all of these different diseases, but I'm going to give you a sort of an overview of diffuse disease as it might be related to, to general kind of physicians. And I think there's a couple of the first slide really is a slide that shows you lots of different boxes with names in them. But there are three fundamental questions when you see somebody with uh, diffuse disease on, in their interstitium. And remember, we're, we compartmentalize lung disease into the airways and the interstitium. So when we see interstitial disease, we think, first of all, is this inflammation or is it fibrosis? Uh, we think, if it's inflammation, is it granulomatous or not granulomatous? And then we think, do we know the cause? Is there something we can identify as a cause or is it idiopathic? And in our terminology then, uh, we've come up with these dreadful terms called usual interstitial pneumonitis, UIP, which is a pathological term. We can see x-ray changes that relate to that pathological term, but basically what it means is a type of fibrosis that's likely to progress over time. So that's where the term UIP really has come from, and that's what I would consider it. And if it's idiopathic and you have UIP, you have idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. The second is uh, inflammation, and for us, NSIP, nonspecific interstitial pneumonitis, really means that the predominant finding on the lung biopsy is inflammation rather than fibrosis. So when you see the term NSIP, we think inflammation. And the reason that's such a big issue is, as you've heard from Toby earlier, if someone has fibrosis that's progressive, you want to treat them with antifibrotic therapy, but you really don't want to miss people who have inflammation in the lung, which I think can respond to treatment. So I show you two x-rays here, and the question is, if we're talking about idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis as a prototype, I'm going to say this is the prototype disease today, which of the two x-rays, A or B, is likely to have idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis? Um, you can see A has a little bit of peripheral interstitial changes, and B has widespread uh, nodular disease. And um, the more abnormal x-ray appears to be B, and you would say maybe that's the worst disease, but if I told you the person in A is 72, and the person in the B x-ray is a 27-year-old uh, female, you might change your approach, because we know idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis occurs in older patients. And uh, if you look at the distribution of the disease, on the white bars here, sarcoidosis tends to occur in a condition in people between the ages of 20 and 40, uh, a little more common in females than males. Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is rarely seen less than the age of 55, 60, and peak, you know, we, we make the diagnosis in late 60s, really. So the x-rays can be helpful because the distribution of the disease is important, as we'll say in a second. It's likely idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is becoming more common. I think most studies would back that up. Uh, and it's not just on diagnosis uh, in terms of access to diagnostic tests, where sarcoidosis, at least in the United Kingdom, is a stable disease. We have a high prevalence of sarcoidosis in Ireland. I'm going to show you just a prototype in a second. Uh, probably 40 to 80 per 100,000. Um, and idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, we don't know the prevalence in this country, which is a deficit we have. But we certainly have under-recognized the amount of the disease. So just to give you the prototype, I think, for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, then the few cases I'm going to do, we're going to compare to that. So it'll be typically a person in their late 60s, early 70s. It's really an insidious disease, progressive shortness of breath, often with a dry cough. We heard from anne Maria how difficult that cough can be to treat. They will have fine crackles on exam, finger clubbing in 50% of the cases, and it's not a systemic disease, and the labs are pretty normal. Uh, if you look at the pulmonary function tests, they're usually restrictive, and what I mean by restrictive is most cases the total lung capacity will be reduced and the lungs will be small. And if you look at a series of x-rays, which is critical, over time, 2012 to 2015, the lungs shrink. So the first patient in patient A, we're looking at their x-ray 2015. If you had the x-ray from 2012, you can see the lungs have gotten smaller over that period of time. Why do we hear crackles on exam? If you look at the CT scan, which shows the classic um, findings of, um, of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, the, um, and I don't know which is the pointer here, but yeah, the, uh, when we put our stethoscope on the chest, we're going to be listening right over here at the base of the lungs, all of this fibrotic diseased airway, this honeycomb formation is right under our stethoscope, so we typically hear crackles in this disease, and these patients tend to desaturate when they walk. 
This constellation of findings, restrictive lung disease, crackles, honeycomb on CT scan, distribution in the lower zones of the lung in the subpleural area is consistent with UIP, that fibrotic disease I mentioned. When you don't know the cause, finger clubbing probably, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, we have exactly the same findings in rheumatoid arthritis and asbestosis. So it's the same disease essentially, but it seems in different patients. If we take sarcoidosis, the young lady I showed you the x-ray of, the very abnormal x-ray, uh, this is a disease that's typically, uh, often presents without respiratory symptoms, actually 27, peak age is 20 to 40, often non-smokers, might be progressive, but it's more chest pain, chest discomfort, that sort of thing, and often with systemic findings, erythema nodosum, uveitis, the X, the CT scan in this case, in her case, is more restrictive with the total lung capacity that's reduced in a reduced DLCO, it can be obstructive. This is the CT scan. If you look at the difference between this and the last case, we're talking more upper lobe nodular disease. We get down to the basis, it looks pretty normal. And that this is around the bronchovascular bundles. It's around the center of the lung. So when you put the stethoscope on this person's chest, despite the really abnormal lung findings on, CT, on chest x-ray, her chest is clear because we don't hear any crackles here. It's away from our stethoscope. This is when we used to do transbronchial biopsies and we might pick up this, this kind of um, amorphous granuloma as a diagnosis. So if we just compare those two cases, on one side we have idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and the other on sarcoid, Older patients, slow progression, no systemic illness, uh, really nothing extrapulmonary, normal labs, restrictive physiology, basis and subpleural, this honeycombing reticular finding and oxygenate that will drop when you exercise. So they're really different diseases. So now what I'm going to do is we're going to talk about something completely different, right? And if you remember Monty Python, which probably when I was putting this together, nobody does, but, uh, but uh, the reason I put this up is these are different diseases, but they're, lo lo they're linked by the fact that they're diffuse lung diseases. And the question is, we're going to make a comparison. Are they really that like uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis? So this is a case from a good few years ago of a, a, a poor man who's only 36 years old, perfectly well Actually, the only past history he had six weeks ago, he had a laminectomy performed, and he progressed for progressive shortness of breath over four weeks. A little bit of a viral prodrome, but very little in the way of a prodrome. You can see that he's got a lot of uh, abnormalities on the right side of his chest, much less on the left. It's quite diffuse. I can't really say if it's airspace or fibrosis based on this, and for all we know, this could just be pneumonia that he's coming in with. Uh, however, he had pretty rapid progression, we admitted this man actually from a clinic, he arrived just on a routine. And when you look at his CT scan, he had ground glass changes. I don't know if you can see this, the airways are being to be distorted. He has traction bronchiectasis showing that there's some fibrosis within this lung. And he rapidly progressed over a period of about two weeks. Um, he got intubated after 24, 48 hours and uh, he actually succumbed, he died from this disease. So, what is the disease then? Well, we know it's not typical of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. He's too young. It's too acute. He got sick over six weeks. He's really got no much, not much in the way of extra pulmonary findings, but he is a little systemically unwell. Labs were pretty normal. Patchy distribution, mixtures of this haziness in the lung and this reticulation, and he was very hypoxic. So there's a lot of differences here. He had a lung biopsy, and his lung biopsy shows a lot of work here, lots of neutrophils in the lungs, and then in his airways, he's got these little pink structures. And this is, I suppose, for the purposes of what we think about it, this is debris that's getting in and kind of get beginning to organize in the lung, and these are called hyaline membranes when we look at them under high power. And this is what we would have called um, Hammond-Rich syndrome in 1935, when it was originally described, uh, but it's now called acute interstitial pneumonitis, AIP. Now, it's very rare. I would say we might, as respiratory physicians, see a handful of these cases in our careers, I think. That's not to say that ARDS doesn't occur, and there is a similarity between this and ARDS. Um, but if you look at the prognosis on the cases we see of this, the slow-burning lung injury, over 65% of people still die from it with mortality rate and, you know, in ARDS, 50 years after original description of it, is about 50, 30% now, so it's, there's a huge difference between it. Um, I, I say we rarely see this, but a man came into clinic today, but he's 69, who's been perfectly well and got sick about eight weeks ago and has a very similar presentation to this man. Whether he has a different disease or not, we don't know yet. So there's not much to say really about this. There's quite little limiter, 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 limited literature on it. 
As you say, it's often ground glass and architectural distortion. And to us, we mean that means the lung is damaged. There's, there's widening of the bronchi, there's fibrosis, there's scarring in the lungs. If you do a biopsy, you'll see this diffuse alveolar damage with hyaline membranes, and we don't know the cause of it. In this man, we treated him on high dose steroids. He had some cyclophosphamide, um, and although he rallied for a short while, he died from the disease. Okay, so the next case then is a 50-year-old lady who presents with three to four months history of shortness of breath and chest tightness. She's crackles on exam and she's a little hypoxic, 88, 90% at rest. Um, so her x-ray, it's hard to tell if this is just penetration. It's a bit hazy in the lung fields, but certainly none of that fibrotic or linear shadows that we saw on the other x-ray. And that's confirmed when you look at the CT scan. We call this ground glass changes. Right, and ground glass changes to us is that the lung architecture is normal. We can see all the lovely vessels coming out here to the periphery of the lung. There's not a lot in the way of any thickening of the actual uh, septae, but it's like someone put a, va uh, you know, a veil over the lung. It looks a bit hazy. So there's diffuse changes on this scan. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about ground glass in a second, but this is the expiratory scan. So when we do CT scans, we look at the inspiratory, expiratory phases because what it tells us is if there's a little bit of a component of airways disease, what's called air trapping. And we can see little black areas here and white areas here because the segments of lung are emptying at different rates, suggesting there is some air trapping on this scan. And there's an interesting finding just at the bases, I don't know if you see it here, it's just a little lace work because I'm going to show you this in a second, a little bit of linear shadows down here, which probably doesn't project that well. So there is a little bit of fibrosis on this scan, I think, in the bases as well. But the dominant finding is ground glass. And ground glass generally to us means it's probably got some inflammatory component. This is this lady's CT scan. Again, it's restrictive. The DLCO 49%, total lung capacity 71%, not a lot of airflow abnormality. But maybe if you want to look at this value here, there might be a little bit of airflow changes, which is just these are the sort of um, um, smaller airway segments of the lung, which can be quite variable, but sometimes are helpful. So again, if we look at this case, patient is younger than typically you see in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. It's subacute. It's not, an, it's not a slow burning disease. She's a little hypoxic at baseline, uh, just sitting at rest. The dominant finding is ground glass changes and the disease is restrictive. So some similarities, but, um, but not enough to say that we think this is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. If you see ground glass changes on an x-ray, these are the sort of things you might think of. Infection, including pneumocystis pulmonary edema, hemorrhage into the lung, prognosis, as I'll just show you very quickly, or any of these inflammatory pneumonitis disease, which includes NSIP and various other IPs, which I won't go into. This is a case of heart failure, big heart, uh, ICD, haziness in the lung. It looks not that dissimilar to this lady, but she didn't seem to be in heart failure. And at least in the, in, in, I, I've been, I've, I've seen a few people who've had lungs biopsy that were in heart failure, so you do want to avoid that. Um, alveolar hemorrhage, I think can look like ground glass, but it's often denser when people hemorrhage into the lungs. So you might see this in Wegener's, lupus, you know, mixed cryoglobinemia, these sort of alveolar hemorrhage diseases. This is pneumocystis. Um, again, maybe not a brilliant case of it, but there's a little bit of thickening down here, and this was new, uh, PCP positive. And alveolar prognosis is a very interesting disease because it's an autoimmune disease. It's due to surfactant building up in the lung. This is all the haziness of surfactant, and it seems to be related to antibodies against the um, GMCSF um, protein or receptor because when we looked at knockouts of that particular growth factor, they in mice, they developed alveolar prognosis. So although this is a rare disease, its uh, pathogenesis is becoming a little clearer. So none of this was the diagnosis in this case. And uh, you have to take a history here. And I don't know if you're going back to Monty Python. The parrot has ceased to be. You might remember that sketch. This lady, and, and actually it's important to recognize she didn't have a dead parrot at home uh, because parrots have to be alive for you to get uh, a reaction to them. And birds, it's, 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 the, it's the excretions. It's the stuff that they put out, that people, that it's an organic antigen that gets all over the place. And that's what drives the reaction that causes hypersensitivity and pneumonitis. And that's what this lady had. And if you look at the history here, um, the first diagnosis of um, hypersensitive pneumonitis um, in, um, in bird workers was 1966. And if you look at it, um, you know, there's pigeons and exotic birds. It's more common if you keep pigeons than exotic birds. It's more common in women than men, so if you do have birds at home. But the rates of prevalence are very enormously, but up to 20% of people can actually get uh, hypersensitive pneumonitis from bird exposure. 
if we look at farmer's lung, which is another hypersensitive pneumonitis, that was described first in 1935, which I couldn't get the reference for, uh, reviewed in 1952, but it was related to hay exposure. So why do we now, 0.4 to 7% of farmers, humid environments, kind of country that we might live in, seasonal variations, we don't see farmer's lung anymore, as uh, Cahill Breeden noted quite a few years ago, because people now you know, farm with silage, they don't use hay very much, so the actual antigen isn't there anymore. So the strike rates are quite high, and we probably could come up with about, I think there's about 2,000 causes of hypersensitive pneumonitis, but um, uh, we can't go through them all, but some have very high rates, and this is an interesting one, hot tub lung, which we don't have much in Ireland, not a huge number of hot tubs, uh, you know, air conditioners are the same thing, but this is Mycobacterium avium intracellular RA inhaled into the lung, causing a similar antigenic stimulus that causes this disease. And about 50% of this, in these studies, in that environment, about 50% of people who get exposed get the disease. So there is a high rate in certain diseases. In this lady's case, she, was, uh, she actually worked in her son's pet shop, believe it or not, and uh, this was what we found, that she was markedly positive. She had precipitating antibodies, which are IgG antibodies, to these uh, bird antigens, so very positive. Does that make the diagnosis? Um, that's a question that uh, is probably it doesn't. The blood test on its own doesn't. Um, we have different things we put together to make a diagnosis, and we have to decide if someone needs a lung biopsy and hypersensitive pneumonitis. And this is a busy slide, but basically what it tells you is, do you, are you exposed to a known, a known antigen? In this case, she was, right? Can you link it to the actual exposure? People rarely link it. The bird is at home. They rarely tell you the bird. They're, they're poor at telling us that. I don't see a lot of people that I've seen haven't lost weight, but they will have crackles on exam and high precipitating antibodies. But you're at a 60% probability of the diagnosis there. So you can vary around this, but at the end of the day, she had a biopsy in this case. A lot of times we wouldn't actually biopsy the patient. And what it shows is lots of blue cells, which are lymphocytes. These giant cells with clefts called cholesterol clefts, and then this loose granuloma, quite different from the sarcoid granuloma, which really is consistent with the diagnosis. So just to go through this, uh, hypersensitive pneumonitis, the disease is commoner than we anticipate. If you keep birds at home, it's much more common, so you've got to ask about those birds if someone comes in, and we've missed it over the years. Usually chest tightness. Interestingly, they'll often have, just like any granulomatous disease, they might have a urinary calcium that's elevated, just like sarcoid. It's a class. It's, it's basically the difference is how the antigen seems to be presented. So MHC class antigens seem to drive how you present this antigen, which derives whether you'll have this hypersensitivity response to the disease or not. Um, smoking protects, as I've said, when you switch off your immune system with uh, cigarettes, it does protect you from certain things, but we're not recommending that today anyway. And the clinical diagnosis really is this constellation of e issues. Is the clinical fit? Is the serology positive? It's very specific, but it's not, it's very sensitive, but its specificity is not good enough to make a diagnosis. Do you see a lot of lymphocytes? And they're often CD8 lymphocytes on BAL, and do you need a biopsy? Get rid of the birds and take some steroids and you'll get better, but 20% have fibrosis. So 20% uh, have f scarring in their lungs, but we don't expect it to progress over time. So in this particular case, 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, so why am I following her up if she's gotten rid of the birds? Uh, we're following her up because she had a bit of a bump in DLCO, and then it started declining because of the fibrosis. And again, I'm drawing your attention to this lacy stuff down here, this almost lymphangitic kind of spread of the disease there. So that's unusual. And this is her last year where there is definitely an increase in the amount of inflammation there. And actually, this is neutrophilic when you wash this out. It's not lymphocytes. It's not typical of hypersensitive pneumonitis. So what do we have to think about when someone progresses when they shouldn't with the disease? Did we get the diagnosis right? So we have had a second opinion, and we, at least on the basis of the second opinion, had the original diagnosis right. It was a classic case. Has she really gotten rid of the birds? Is she still back in that pet shop? So I haven't been out to Tume to check the pet shop, but I checked her uh, tests again, as I'll show you, and they were negative. There is an important thing you have to remember, though. It can be, it can be at home in, 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 you know, feather duvet lung does cross-react with, uh, with hypersensitive pneumonitis. So you've got to be careful they don't have feather duvets at home. 100% of people who've had feather duvet lung are female, which uh, I don't know why, but they are anyway. And um, she didn't have any feather duvets. And importantly, I checked her antigen panel again. It's negative. And that reassures me it's unlikely she's still got antigens in the background. 
So the last five minutes, I wanted to talk a little bit about what else can go on with these diseases. And what she has is a very disturbing and autoimmune profile that she's developed, at least since we originally diagnosed her. Initial autoimmune profile was negative, but we, don't, we didn't traditionally check for these antibodies when we actually saw her first. And the question is, we don't know the answer. I don't know, Toby may have an opinion, but we don't check these to routinely in people coming in. But these are called the myositis panel, the panel that goes with dermatomyositis. And there's some suggestion that we're seeing patients who have an autoimmune disease as their first presentation with lung disease. And unfortunately for us, in this case, these are not a good profile. This MDA5 is not a good antibody. So that brings us to, you know, when we're looking at people with interstitial lung disease, we're very cautious to look for autoimmune findings. Uh, a group have put together a statement on this interstitial pneumonia with autoimmune features, and it tries to give us a perspective if someone's coming in, do they have autoimmune disease? We don't know the significance of it yet. Right, so this is more a, 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 you know, a hypothesis-driven issue, but we are looking at it. And it basically goes through, you can send a load of antibodies off, you can look for certain things on the actual CT scan or on the biopsy that points you towards that, and you can look at the patient very closely. And the things that we see, and we've picked quite a few, I think we might have five cases in the last year that we changed our approach to, is things like these things, mechanics hands, where the skin begins to crack, or you see, well, this, is, this, this is the hand of a young lady who had been recently diagnosed with psoriasis, had a lung biopsy for interstitial lung disease. It showed organizing pneumonia. And it was actually on a membership tutorial that we saw her hand. And this is Gottron's nodules. This is dermatomyositis. But this organizing pneumonia did not actually get better, unfortunately, for her. So we're much more vigilant about this. Now, will we be saying in five years, these are patients that we treat differently? We don't know that yet. But we're looking for that inflammatory signal, because inflammatory, in, in, inflammatory, autoimmune-related lung disease is more likely to be inflammatory. Obviously, clear clot scleroderma. I showed this as nonspecific interstitial pneumonitis, which we spoke about. Um, this progresses in some patients to more fibrotic phenotype, so we have to be aware of that. This lady died of lung cancer. Uh, fibrotic lung disease, 14-fold increase of lung cancer, so we have to be careful about that as well. When we look at autoimmune disease, all of these things, these dreadful terms, UIP, NSIP, diffuse alveolar damage, they can all occur in these diseases. Uh, I didn't put Sjogren's up here, but scleroderma, 50% of diffuse scleroderma have interstitial lung disease. Rheumatoid, a huge number have abnormal CT scans, uh, but UIP and maybe f uh, clinically significant, maybe 14%, and this whole issue of the dermatomyositis phenotype that we are concerned about. And I just put these up as papers showing that uh, we're beginning to pick out bad markers for interstitial lung disease in this population. How do you treat it? Well, we don't know how to treat it. Um, um, if you look at the uh, experience, rituximab is coming out as something that people use. Probably the best trials that you have to give credit to the scleroderma group have done two trials looking at different treatments. This is using a comparison of cyclophosphamide and mycophenolate uh, mofetal, which uh, is cell sept, and essentially 24 months of mycophenolate was about the same as cyclophosphamide. And then in these non-specific interstitial diseases that we worry about, connective tissue diseases, mycophenolate in retrospective studies and rituximab seem to be beneficial. So what do we do? Well, we, 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 we have a low threshold to pulse people with autoimmune diseases uh, with steroids, either orally or intravenously. I think the way we've done it in Galway, and there, isn't a, there is no consensus on this, is if someone has very, very pronounced autoimmune findings clinically, we'll move to rituximab immediately, often with Celsept. If we're more hedging, we'll give Celsept, which is mycophenolate. But you've got to get the doses up quite high, and we rarely, rarely use cyclophosphamide. And the last case I'm just going to zip through because I want to finish is a man who presented with another interstitial lung disease that really shouldn't be called an interstitial lung disease. He, had, he was systemically unwell, 65. He had upper lobe changes. They looked like they're kind of rounded opacities. He had restrictive physiology. Um, he has these funny infiltrates. So if you look up here, he's got a little bit of haziness, ground glass changes, surrounded by airspace disease. And over here, this is kind of a triangular-based pleural abnormality that looks more like airspace disease. And the bottom line is when we see this, we think of different things, organizing pneumonia being one, which I'll show you, but it could be cancer, it could be infectious, and there's a whole list of things. And we did a lung biopsy on him. And the lung biopsy essentially showed what we call organizing pneumonia. And I just want to explain that this is inflammation, which is pneumonia. 
and then it's these tufts of fibro, sort of fibrous tissue sitting in the small bronchi. And these fibrous tissue look like wound healing. They shouldn't go away. But if you treat these patients with steroids, they'll often get better. It was described in 1985. Germit had mentioned Murish Fitzgerald. This is from an a, a, a archive of lung biopsies. So the biopsies were taken. They looked at the pathology, and they went back and then looked at the patient. And Murish actually described a disease called DIP in exactly the same manner from the same Gainsler's archives. And essentially, we don't know much too much about this disease. Mostly, it occurs idiopathically. There's usually a viral infection. You see this interesting reverse halo. So I just showed you that picture where this haziness with some inflammatory disease around it. And most people will get uh, a big improvement and some will get fully better with this. So, um, so that's it. Um, I'm just going to finish up there. I think we've had enough now and uh, we'll take it from there then. So thanks very much. Thank you.